All right, welcome to our unit on diversity. Uh, we're going to talk first in the first three chapters about microbial diversity, and then we'll talk about in chapter 13 some ways of controlling microbial diversity, things like how antibiotics work, how we clean surfaces, um, and all of these things that are related to the diversity of life here. So we're going to learn about bacteria in chapter 10. In chapter 11, we will talk about some of the eukaryotes periodic microbes, mainly pathogenic ones that we call parasites, um, things like Giardia, Toxoplasma, things like this. And then in chapter 12, we will talk about one of my favorite topics, viruses. Viruses are fascinating. But there are so many viruses out there that we're going to focus ourselves onto a couple key disease-causing viruses. So in chapter 10, we're going to start with bacterial diversity. So when we say diversity, we mean uh, what is out there? And this is a fascinating question because bacteria, we don't know everything that's out there. We're still learning. This image right here, we're going to come back to it several times. It's not critical that you in any way memorize this, uh, but what I want you to realize is that this is what's called a phylogenetic tree. It's basically a tree of life right? It's how our organisms related. So everywhere we have these branches that meet together at what are called nodes, that's an area where organisms had a common ancestor. So we could go all the way back down here to the root of life, right? Where archaea, eukaryotes, and bacteria all have a common ancestor. We are going to focus on the bacterial part of the tree. We will talk about eukaryotic microbes later, uh, which is a small part of eukarya. And we're not really going to get to talk about archaea. They're just so diverse that this course is a 100 level course. We can't even get into them at this point. We're going to talk about the main groups of bacteria that are in here. There are a large number of bacterial groups in here, but we can kind of focus it down. So we'll talk about diversity of microbes generally associated with the human body. Um, we'll talk about major kinds of gram positive, gram negative, as well as some other groups that don't really fall into those two classifications. And we'll talk a little bit about how pathogens life cycles can affect diseases in this chapter. So as always, let's start with a case study. This one, uh, we have an individual, Cody, he's 32, he's from Fort Worth, Texas, uh, goes into town, shoots some pool at the local bar, and after a few drinks, got into a little scuffle with, uh, with his buddy Ty, who was also drunk, so... As happens uh, when you drink too much, uh, sometimes you you get into it with some people, right? Hopefully you're not doing this on the regular, but it happens, right? Um, and so he he socks his buddy in the face, and that makes short work a tie. But in the process, he gets a wound on his hand, and this wound is a bite wound. So sometimes when people punch other people in the face, they hit their teeth. That probably hurts for the person who got socked in the teeth, but it also can cause wounds that break the skin on the hands. So in a couple of days, his hand starts to swell up. So you can see where the skin was broken. Um, and there is a large amount of pus that is forming here. Uh, pus, as we'll learn in the next unit, is white blood cells that are going to the sites of infection to try to deal with the microbes that are there. So he's also uh, swollen. That is the result of bacteria that form gas. So the skin is actually swelling because there are bacteria that are growing and they're producing gases that are causing it to swell. So he can't even move his fingers because of this. He also has a fever. The area is super warm to the touch and his overall body temperature is 102 Fahrenheit, which is above normal, right? Um, so he obviously has some sort of microbial infection going on here. X-ray shows that he doesn't have broken bones, but we need to take a swab of the wound and send it to the lab for culture. We need to know what types of bacteria are in there to prescribe the correct antibiotics. In this case, the culture comes back in two days, and we find that he has what's called a polymicrobial infection. So poly means many, so many microbes infecting him. He has several different species in there. 
Iconella corrodens, Streptococcus pyogens, Fusobacterium nucleatum, and Porphyrmonis gingivales, which we've actually seen before in the chapter when we talked about biofilms and plaque. Uh, Porphyrmonis gingivales, a very common mouth bacteria. So this is a key point. Uh, we have what are called three very different phyla here. We will talk about phyla in a moment, but phyla are groupings of organisms. Uh, so he has very diverse bacteria in there. Where did they come from, right? Well, there's a couple of possibilities. They could have been on his skin, and when he uh, hit that person's tooth and broke the skin, they could have been, uh, you know, uh, put into the soft tissue. The other possibility, and this one signals that possibility, is that the bacteria from the person's mouth that he punched have been transferred into his soft tissues in there. And one of the key points of this chapter is, is that we have a large number of bacteria that live on and in us, and that is our normal microbiome. They have certain places that they live, and when they get out of those places, they can cause disease. So mouth bacteria, these mouth bacteria probably were not causing disease to the individual that he punched, but when they got introduced into the soft tissues of his hand, they were out of position and the body didn't have defenses against them. So they started an infection, uh, which led to this severe uh, swelling and pus and necrosis, really. So, um, so he has cellulitis, which is an infection of the soft tissue, uh, not the muscle there. Um, and this is from mouth bacteria here. They're causing a serious infection there. So the treatment here is to debride the wound, which basically means to remove that dead tissue that's in there, um, cleaning it, irrigating it out. They're going to use hydrogen peroxide, which we know is very toxic to many microbes, um, to, to uh, clean that out. And of course, we're gonna prescribe an antibiotic. In this case, amoxicillin is prescribed. It's a broad spectrum antibiotic. And he's not sure about his tetanus immune status, so they give him a tetanus vaccine. We will learn about tetanus vaccines in the next unit, but tetanus is a bacteria that can produce a toxin. And the vaccine can actually be given after the bacteria enters the body because the vaccine fights the toxin that uh, tetanus makes so um, he's just given one as a precaution so this is just uh, you know a, a quick example of how microbial diversity can impact our health right uh, all of those bacteria normally found in the mouth generally no problems with them unless they get out of control uh, but when they move to a new location then we have issues and can have major infections that happen so chapter 10.1, we're going to quickly go through bacterial diversity, just the overview, and then we will dive into each group in, uh, in the subsequent sections. We have seven major groups of bacteria. We call them the superphyla. We have two types in gram positives, two types in gram negatives, spirochetes, cyanobacteria, and the chlamydiaes. So we will talk about each of those in subsequent chapters. We'll just do an overview right now. Uh, we'll talk about some of the positive roles of bacteria in the ecosystem, and we will talk about how new pathogens can emerge and cause disease. So back to our tree of bacteria here. Uh, we're going to talk about several different groups, um, firmicutes, actinobacteria, proteobacteria, bacteroides, um, spirochetes, chlamydiae, and uh, some other groups in here. So we're going to focus on a few of these groups. Um, you can see there are some representative species, our groups under here. Um, we're not going to dive into the kind of real... Um, strange ones, I guess is the best way. So like Aquafex here is a hot spring thermophile that lives in Yellowstone. Um, 
these are real early emerging in evolutionary terms uh, groups of bacteria and um, they are environmentally important but tend to not cause disease for us. We will also talk about the cyanobacteria which tend to not cause uh, disease but they include the photosynthetic autotrophs which create oxygen so they are indeed very important to us right. Uh, so as you can see there are two groups for the gram staining individuals but then there are some that are outside of the gram groups this is because the gram stain does not work 100 percent perfectly for all microbes because of the way that they've um, evolved their different cell walls and things like this so uh, we will focus on those groups but there are things outside of them as well so what's out there? This is a big question. If you're a scientist and you're really interested in microbial diversity, uh, you still have a lot of work to do because we know that there are at least 30 phyla, which is major groups. So like uh, the Firmicutes is a phyla, um, Actinobacteria is a phyla, and in there there's lots of species and things like this. We know there's 30 of these that are out there that can be grown in the lab. So we can grow 30 broad groups of bacteria in the lab. There are about 20 more that we have DNA evidence for that we can actually uh, detect by DNA methods, but we don't know how to grow them. Um, and then the scary thought is, is that there might be as many as a thousand phyla out there that we haven't even detected. So this is just an estimate, but we think that we don't know even the half of it, right? We don't know what's out there. So there's lots of room to discover new species and microbes out there. All the time we're finding new things. So there are members of most of these phyla in the human microbiome, we have representatives of almost all of them that can be found in and on your body. Uh, we really need to know about this diversity, right? Because this is where our disease causing organisms primarily are. How do you treat them? What's related to what? That leads to, if they're related, maybe you can use similar treatments or uh, maybe we need new treatments because it's a new type of microbe that we've never seen before. Um, diversity can tell us a lot about what might be causing a disease. So these seven major phyla, the super phyla we call them, um, they have large impacts on human health, obviously, and of course our ecosystem. Uh, all of the oxygen that we get, right? We think a lot of it comes from trees, but there are so many photosynthetic microbes out there. They were the original oxygenators, so we owe them a lot, our existence, basically. So these impacts on human health and our ecosystem, these can be both uh, positive and negative. We have things like uh, E. coli that is in our gut, helps us digest our food, but we also have pathogenic forms of E. coli, just like we talked about in the lab, the Shiga toxin, producing E. coli causes bloody diarrhea and disease. So uh, that's one example, right, where uh, knowing about diversity uh, is critical to understanding the differences between those and knowing why one causes disease and one doesn't. Another example, Bacillus anthracis can cause anthrax poisoning, whereas the related species, Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt, can be used as an insecticide. It only kills insects. So uh, many farmers actually use this bacteria on corn crops and things like this to kill uh, worms that um, try to burrow into the roots of those and kill their crops. So uh, knowing about the diversity can give us new tools that we can use for biotechnology. All right, we got to go through the boring part of listing the groups. Uh, each of them has some interesting properties, and we'll dive into them in detail in their own sections. The gram positives, we have two groups here. We have the firmicutes, which are named for their thick cell walls, um, and the firmicutes can also produce endospores. And then we also have the actinobacteria. These are of great importance because a lot of our antibiotics were found in actinobacteria. Those are our main gram positive groups, the two, two phyla in there. Gram negatives, we have the proteobacteria. This is very diverse. This contains a large amount of our gram negative pathogens. E. coli, Shigella, Salmonella, all kinds of things. Uh, the plague is in there. Um, so we'll talk a lot about them. We also have the other phyla in the gram negatives, the bacteroidetes, uh, which 
Um, they're all gram-negative rods, and most are obligate anaerobes. They live in our intestines, which are low-air environments, and they help us digest a lot of our food. The spirochetes form a very tight, coiled uh, cell shape, um, and they can actually move uh, by spiraling along. Um, they might have flagella on them. There are some important diseases in here. Cyanobacteria, as we mentioned, um, going to produce a lot of oxygen through photosynthesis, so very important that way. And then the chlamydiae, um, this is a phylum of, of obligate intracellular pathogens. So they have to be inside, which is intra, of a cell to grow. Um, there are several critical diseases here, and uh, this is an interesting group. Uh, when I was at Washington State University, there was a lab that worked on chlamydia. Um, and it's very tough to grow because you have to grow it inside of other cells. And we don't uh, quite understand why it's lost all of the genes to be able to grow free living. So that's an active area of research, how to grow it and things like this. Okay, so I'm going to keep coming back to this, right? Uh, cyanobacteria, firmicutes, actinobacteria, proteobacteria, bacteroidetes, spirochetes, Chlamydiae are the ones that we are talking about here. So we talked in the last chapter about mechanisms of genetic diversity in microbes. Um, so we know about things like transposition and uh, transformation, transduction with viruses, conjugation. Um, so there's a broader field of study, and we'll come back to this later uh, when we talk about epidemiology, but um, there are constantly, as we've seen, new microbes evolving. That's how we have that whole tree of life there. Uh, and how they evolve and where they evolve is of key interest to us because pathogens have to come from somewhere, and we need to be monitoring this. I think our recent experiences with the SARS-CoV-2 virus kind of emerging out of nowhere uh, shows us that we need to be out there looking for these things and being prepared for the next big pathogen that might attack us. So pathogens can come from new places. Uh, pathogens tend to start as microbes that are non-pathogenic and they will acquire traits that make them pathogenic. That could be through things like horizontal gene transfer, which we talked about, right? Transformation, taking up genes from the environment, um, things like this. So uh, we have some sort of ancestral cell that gains new traits and can become a new pathogen. And that happens when microbes interact. And there's several places microbes interact. Obviously, the environment is a big one, right? Just out there in the soil, in the water, in the air, microbes are coming in contact with one another. But we also have key uh, groups of animals that can be um, reservoirs for microbes. So we want to often monitor closely related animals like livestock and things like this that humans come into contact with constantly because many microbes can interact inside of livestock and uh, or just animals in general, deer, uh, elk, things like that out in the wilderness. And these uh, microbes, if we get a disease-causing microbe that can be transmitted to a human uh, and cause disease in a human, we call this event a zoonosis. Um, zoonoses is the plural. So this is one of the most common ways that new pathogens emerge. And this is what we think happened with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we believe that people interacted with bats and acquired the new novel coronavirus from bats. We also have a related group of organisms to the, the ones that we interact with uh, that we don't directly interact with. These can be called shelter species. So things like worms, nematodes, things like that, that are out there in the environment that can interact uh, with microbes and then interact with some sub uh, animal or uh, plant or thing like that, that uh, then we interact with. They can lead to pathogens being transmitted to us. So all of these places where there are microbes mixing together and interacting are possible drivers of new pathogen evolution here. But it's not all doom and gloom. There are some ways that we can influence microbial evolution as well. And there are pros and cons to this. There are ethical and philosophical debates about this. But 
we know how to do it, so it's probably going to happen. We have to think about this very carefully, but there are opportunities for great benefits to humans, and uh, there are also opportunities for great harm to humans here. Things like engineering microbes with enzymes to break down contaminants, so microbes that would eat up oil from an oil spill, or uh, using viruses in phage therapy. So remember, phages are viruses that infect bacteria. We could use those phages to kill bacteria instead of using antibiotic drugs. That is a possibility, right? Attack pathogens, um, bacteria with viruses that infect them and kill them. Synthetic organisms. This is already possible. We've made organisms that contain new nucleotides that have not been seen in nature. We might want to do this to uh, control the growth of our engineered organisms, right? If they have nucleotides that can't be found in nature that they need to grow and divide, that's a potential control on them. Maybe we could use these as microbial factors and using these new nucleotides, we could pre prevent them from escaping into the environment where the nucleotides don't exist. Uh, then we have scary possibilities, right? Bioweapons, bioterror, how do we prevent this from being made? How do we defend against this? These are all things that we can use microbial evolution to help us with. And there's many, many more examples there. All right, so looking at diversity, we will come back to these concepts and think about evolution and, and how it can impact us both health-wise and biotechnology-wise and environmentally in the following sections.